it because of Blair. That's true of each of you, really. You know, I mean, I, I love what this organization is about. Um, and I know what it takes to stand up and run for office. And I would dare say it's even more difficult in a place where, let's say, the uh, Democrats aren't a majority and folks looking at you like, what? And, uh, you know, you stand up and be like, look, like the only way we're going to make progress is by running in these places, like where you live, uh, and winning. And, Absolutely. And, and it takes people like you with a character and fortitude to just stand up and say, I know what's right, and I'm going to make that possible for the people in my district. That's why when I, I was asked to do this, I was like, of course. Like, I, I love what this organization is about. I love what each of you is about. And I'm going to love it even more after uh, you wind up members of Congress, when you're all like there being like, they didn't think it could be done. Uh, and I, I'm something, I, I guess I have some experience with doing things that people don't think can be done. <laughs> nice. Well, you did. You definitely, uh, you definitely opened a lot of eyes across this country. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know that uh, with, you know, if we can continue to elevate uh, these candidates and, and get them, you know, uh, the ability to be seen and heard all across this country, I believe wholeheartedly people are going to start donating to our candidates because we have amazing candidates. I couldn't agree more. And that's what tonight's about is for people to get to know the incredible candidates here. And I've been a candidate, so I know everyone's like, let me at them, let me at them. <laughs> I'm not sure if, if I should kick this thing off. Um, Richard, do you want to say anything else before we, we start introducing the candidates to the people who are here in attendance? Uh, does anybody have anything they want to run real quick? If not, I say we go ahead and kick it off. Let's go. Go ahead. Let's do it. Well, first, thank you all for being here tonight. I will say this is going to be a much more human and interesting program than whatever nonsense that they're picking up at the RNC. I tweeted last night, I was like, wow, this RNC has a real Starship Troopers vibe to it. Uh, and a lot of people <laughs> like that because they remember the same movie I do, which they were watching this being like, it's kind of eerie. Um, that's what are the RNC is about. And this is like the opposite of that because these are these are just homegrown human beings who stood up and said, we need better in Congress. I believe I can contribute. There's just so much humanity and character here. And we're gonna speak to the first four candidates, Dr. Gary Wegman in Pennsylvania 9th District, Devin Pandy uh, in Georgia 9th District, Cindy Banya in Florida 19th District, and Lindsey Simmons in Missouri's 4th District. Hello, everyone. Hello, Andrew. Hey. Great to meet you, Andrew. Yeah, it's great to meet you, too. Really, you all are awesome. And I'm going to ask a question, and then we'll have each of you address a little bit. I was just joking about the RNC. And I would say the RNC has had two big messages that I could discern after, uh, you know, six-plus hours of uh, mind-numbing watching. <laughs> Number one, I joke that it's like everything is awesome. There, there was still like this, the things are great kind of message. And then the, the flip side of that was be very afraid. Those are like the two messages that I seem to be getting from the RNC. And in reality, you all know what's going on in your districts. You've been campaigning in different ways. So would love to hear from each of you, but what the reality is, where you, you live uh, and are campaigning. And let's start with you. Gary, um, medical doctors running for office, I already love it. But Gary, take it away. Thank you, Andrew. Listen, our ninth district was formerly a healthy mix of textiles, steel, mining, and agricultural sectors. But all of these industries are now struggling even before COVID-19. This administration's trade wars and their failure, failure to reform health care have been hurting our agricultural communities and Rust Belt cities. We need to reimagine our infrastructure, Andrew, by taking advantage of the low interest rates and bringing our country the biggest infrastructure investment program since the Eisenhower administration. We can rebuild our nation's roads and bridges, water systems, plus high-speed rail, develop educational opportunities and apprenticeships, and generate living wage jobs. This will help our uh, communities to recover from COVID-19 and build us back even better than before. I love it, Gary. What kind of doctor are you? I'm a dentist. Practice over 36 years. Wow. I mean, that's some nitty gritty stuff. Like yes. Gary's, yeah, Gary's 
been in there, you know, fixing problems in patients' mouths. Like, it, it seems like pretty good training for DC, in my opinion. <laughs> well, Nine-hour day today, Andrew. Uh, deal with details. Yeah, no, it's true. And your mistakes actually have consequences. Devin, how about you uh, in Georgia? So, District 9 is, well, most of us are mostly rural. Um, lots of agriculture, um, farming, uh, you know, you have dairy, um, poultry. Uh, we like to call ourselves here the, uh, the poultry capital of the world. Uh, we're at least the poultry capital of the region. And, uh, and our people are hurting. Um, and, and it's not only because of COVID-19. Um, before COVID-19, agriculture was still the, the center of our economy. But, um, you know, our workers um, in, in the poultry factories that I was just talking about, um, they were still exploited labor with few, if any, legal protections. And um, the farm bill left the entire forestry industry out to dry. Um, the tariffs on China, a.k.a. the taxes on America um, and on American entrepreneurs um, and the immigration system um, were decimated or they were decimating our farmers' abilities to produce their full yield and bring it to market. Um, there, there have been so many issues that, uh, that have just been exacerbated by COVID-19. So now, right now, during COVID-19, it's, it's really more of the same. Um, there isn't really much of a difference. We've just added COVID-19, except now, instead of taking corporate money from industries that rely on undocumented labor and then, uh, and then de demonizing um, the essential workforce, uh, our, rep our representative, uh, Congressman Doug Collins, he does nothing to protect Americans from the pandemic. And now, you know, this whole time he has been uh, spouting that, you know, um, whatever, actually whatever the president is spouting at the time. And so he's been talking about the it's a hoax, you know, coronavirus is a hoax. You don't need masks. And now he's turned around and he's telling our students who shouldn't be going back to school yet that they can buy his masks for $15 a pop. Wow, that, that sounds like a, a candidate who could use an upgrade. And Devin, I dare say that you represent that upgrade. Uh, Cindy, I might, or, so it looks like you're a doctor as well, though. I, I sense that it might be a doctor of a different discipline in Florida's 19th district. Yeah, that's right. I'm Dr. Cindy Banier, and my doctorate is actually Asia Pacific Studies, of uh, all things, and I got it in Japan. My, you should have been answering all my debate questions then. <laughs> they, they, they. Actually, I've been trying to hold myself back from trying to uh, speak Chinese. Hong Kong, Shui, um, so I know that your family is from Taiwan, so I spent many years there um, and had a lot of fond memories. And just for the record, not a communist, have fought and protested against Beijing in Taiwan at risk of deportation. Just want to clarify that. Well, I mean, ta Taiwan's this, this awesome uh, democracy, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, you enjoyed your time there. But we'd love to hear about uh, what's Sorry. going on in your district. Yeah, let's talk about Florida. Um, so yeah, actually, what is going on in coastal Florida? So as you know, we have Hurricane Laura that is bearing down on our friends in Louisiana and Texas. In fact, our, our friend Rob, um, you know, is right now, we were looking at that here in our district. Every single time a hurricane is coming, we are wondering when it's going to turn towards us. And that creates some instability in our economy and has been uh, for us for a long time to do with global warming, which we need to address. Additionally, as far as economics goes, we have a donut economy where we have a lot of low wage jobs and then we have CEOs and retirees in our district. This has been a perennial problem and, and D Donald Trump has you know, not made it any better. And COVID-19, by the way, has decimated our tourism and retail economy. And I really think that we need change to diversify our economy and make sure that everybody can have a livable age as well as a good quality of life to meet their goals and de desires on their own terms. Thank you, Cindy. The donut economy is spot on. Uh, you know, it, we, we need to fill that thing up, right? This is like not the good donut. This is the bad donut. 
Uh, Lindsay Simmons, you're campaigning in Missouri's 4th District. Uh, how are things there among people that are actually experiencing this stuff day to day? Yeah, so I am an Army wife. My husband is currently deployed overseas. And so I will just tell you from our military community perspective that things have not been great. Um, the president knows that there are bounties on people like my husband who are currently deployed and is doing nothing. When we first learned of COVID-19, um, military service members were asked to go onto base, um, but they didn't have masks. So we had to rig up something from inventory that was used in years past because we literally didn't have the right PPE for our service members. I also represent a very large agricultural community. Um, we have cattle farmers and ranchers who have been forced to put down their own herd because there weren't enough processing no. facilities open because of the monopoly and the unfair market practices that the big four pro, uh, pro, meat producing plants operate. Um, the representative who currently represents my district actually put forward a bill that would make these meat processing factories immune to any liability should their workers contract COVID-19 as a mechanism to continue, you know, keep the machines running and keep making profits, but who cares about the workers? And so I would say that things here have not been great. Our schools were already defunded before COVID-19. COVID-19 has really exacerbated a lot of the problems that exist in my community. And when you have people in elected office who refuse to give additional funding to state and local school districts, but are fine with private schools taking PPP money, you can just see those inequality grow. And so we are really focused here just on, you know, building blocks and trying to keep our schools open, trying to make sure people have PPE and trying to make sure that our farmers can stay afloat during this time. Oh, Lindsay, your husband's off fighting and you're fighting too. That's so uh, incredible. And, and you know, the, the fact that you're running where you are in Missouri, uh, I think you would be an enormous upgrade, whoever the current character is. And that's true of everyone here, really. I mean, that's one I love camp uh, campaigning and helping uh, folks like you is that the gap between you and your opponents is so massive, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, particularly where you all are, are, are running from. So as a country right now, and I said this last week at the DNC debate, um, my wife and I are not sure whether our kids' school is going to reopen, you know, and, and you're all facing something similar. I sense that some of you are parents. Um, how are you dealing with this and what would you propose that we be doing differently to try and get our kids back to school during a pandemic. And let me just say for a moment that I, I think that whatever's going on, we're like giving up on schools a little bit too easily. Like as a parent, uh, schools are kind of crucial to, to you know, how our kids fare. And like, uh, you know, we, I, I feel like we should be fighting harder to try and uh, to have schools be the last thing that we're gonna shut down. Um, so Gary, I'll come to you first. Thank you, Andrew. I, I'd love to talk about top-down leadership, but when it comes to schools, the people with the most skin in the game really need to be able to speak to this issue. And it's not only a question about education, but also about childcare. I mean, I'm lucky enough that my youngest daughter is in high school, but there are millions of families with younger children that depend on schools for childcare, food security, and more. I mean, we need to make sure that we are supporting these families as much as possible, but we also need to stop the spread of COVID-19. So I don't support a one-size-fits-all approach. Schools in areas that have a low prevalence of COVID-19, they should be able to open before schools in areas that have a lot of transmission. We need to support local school districts and get real-time testing as soon as possible so that we can get kids back into the classroom safely. You know what thing I love about Gary? Gary reminds me of me, where he just like lands that plane in whatever time period he has. You know, it's like some folks just keep on going. Gary is like, bing, bang, done. I, I like to think that was how I came across. Um, <laughs> Devin, how about you in uh, northern Georgia? Yeah, so, okay, so the bottom line is, <clears throat> is that we are here in most of most rural places, especially here, in District 9, um, we are massively behind in our infrastructure here. Um, for being the wealthiest, most powerful nation mankind has ever seen, 
Um, we sure seem to think that falling behind on infrastructure is a good way to run an organization. Um, and that organization being the United States of America. Um, and to be honest, Democrats do it too. So this isn't always a partisan thing. Um, but if we don't lay a strong foundation, then there's nothing to build on. So I, I'm a Christian, and Christ said in the New Testament, referring to Peter, on this rock, um, on this rock, I will build, um, oh my gosh, I, I, on this rock, I will build my church. And, uh, and I want America to, to rest on a solid foundation, on a rock solid foundation. Um, so Republicans will put up four walls and a tarp and call it a house. And I just don't think that that's the way to do it. Um, I'm trying to make America the home that our people deserve. Um, too many have paid the ultimate sacrifice um, for us to, to be content with good enough. And in many cases, not good enough. Yeah, it's not even good enough. Right? No, um, not at all. And uh, something that impressed me about your presidential campaign was when you uh, started to answer a really important question for the 21st century. And uh, you said, uh, what does it matter if we have the freedom to do something if we don't have the ability to exercise that freedom? And it's, it's not good enough that you have the right to vote. Um, e election day should be a holiday so that you have the ability to exercise that right to vote. Um, uh, we must have high speed internet. And I know that you asked about schools, but this, it goes along with it because, um, I do believe that, you know, it's cliche, but the children are our future and we need to be investing in them most of all, um, besides anything else and, and until we can get them in those schools. Um, they still need to be learning. They still need to be learning, and they could be doing so online as much as we can. And I trust our teachers to do the best that they can to teach our children, um, you know, through online courses. But here in rural Georgia, we can't do that. We don't have either. We don't have strong enough, uh, fast enough, reliable enough internet, or we don't have it at all. And um, and so uh, we need to. Rural internet needs to touch every single corner of this country. FDR did it with electricity. We need to do it with broadband. And it also needs to be offered as a utility, um, right along with your gas, electric, and water. Um, it should not be a private monopoly like how Georgia Power is here in Georgia. Um, yeah, so we should have 99.9% .9 broadband uh, internet penetration. Exactly. And, and it should be publicly subsidized. So it's not like you go show up someplace and be like, hey, do you have 80 bucks a month or whatever it is? Um, exactly. Then there, there are ways to make this happen. Um, I love it, Devin, and you're right. Uh, it's very, very tied into education because how the heck can you try and educate people if they don't have basic infrastructure uh, or high-speed internet? Uh, Cindy, you, 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 you might be the most educated person in this whole freaking gathering. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, um, but this is something, you know, I can actually speak both about the policy and I will actually kind of dovetail off of what Devin was saying is, yeah, let's get this infrastructure in there. Let's get a, a universal jobs program so we can set the floor for basic wages for uh, employees and uh, benefits and working conditions. I think that's one way that we can revitalize our economy and really restructure it and move away from profiteering off the backs of workers. But in terms of education, I do have two public school children. We picked up my son's uh, school issued laptop today um, because we are also in Florida where we still have thousands of cases of coronavirus a day in our area. We are at 14.9% positivity rate. The WHO recommends in-person school not before 5%. Right. So it has to be five percent or, or below before they recommend it is safe for children to return to school. Now, of course, we do have children that need special access in the classroom, need their food subsidies and parents need to work. So we have in-person option at our schools as well as in uh, remote learning. And I chose for my family and I actually had to fight 
to be able to have remote learning for my family because of the health of my daughter, the circumstances with my family. My youngest daughter, who's not in school, spent the first two years of her life fighting a rare blood disease, and this has left her immune compromised. She's better now, the doctors, and we just did get everything tested. She's doing a lot better now. But as a mom, I'm worried. She had respiratory failure, so COVID-19 is something that just scares me to bits. And I feel like we should be safe rather than sorry. And we have this option, thankfully, that we can do remote learning. A district did an amazing job of putting this together so families like mine have a choice to protect themselves during this pandemic uh, so that the older children do not become vectors of disease that will infect my youngest child. And, you know, I've had to make my campaign, all my work, the university I teach at is all remote. So we are in our house 24 hours a day, seven days a week since the middle of March. And now we're rocketing into the fall of 2020 school year together at home and safe because of coronavirus. And, um, you know, I wish it went that way, but, you know, if we weren't living through the biggest failure in history under Donald Trump and his response to coronavirus, it would be very different. But here we are, and I'm proud of everybody that's involved. Well, Cindy, you managed to get some math in that answer, so <laughs> I really liked it. And you, you actually did seem like the most educated person in this room. Uh, Lindsay, how about in M Missouri? Um, like, uh, what is the school situation and what should we be doing differently? Before COVID, schools in my district were often only going to school four days a week because we already couldn't afford that. That was, that's very much the reality here pre-COVID. So you can imagine since COVID how much tougher it has been to make ends meet for many of our rural school districts. Our governor cut the education budget by $130 million. The representative I'm running to replace has said she refuses to get funding to state and local governments to continue funding schools. At the same time, when the federal government made the CARES Act and gave out money through the Paycheck Protection Program, private schools were able to take loans through that program. Our public schools weren't, increasing that inequality, increasing that gap. And so something, you know, I, I very much agree that broadband is important. I very much agree that investing in infrastructure is important. But right now, the kids in my district are only getting 80% of the education that anybody else was getting before COVID anyway. And so I just want to make this very plain that there are companies and there are corporate interests who are using COVID-19 as a business opportunity. And that is what we saw by through the privatization of public schools. They're trying to make it so that we completely defund public schools and give taxpayer money directly to private schools. That's what they're trying to do with the post office. That is what they're trying to do with weather agencies. That's what they are trying to do during this global pandemic. And I think that when we talk about these things, we have to acknowledge that what is happening is we have people in office making decisions for their corporate donors to undermine our families and working people in our communities. That was a phenomenal summary of everything that's going wrong in America, Lindsay, because you know on one end of it, there's some company making money, and then on the other end, there are people that are suffering and uh, being left behind. I am so excited about all, each of these candidates. Let's give it up for them, Zoom style. Cindy Banyai, Devin Pandy, Lindsay Simmons, and Gary Wegman. Uh, now, if you live anywhere near any of these folks, you got to get out the vote for them. But even if you don't, you know some folks who live near each of them. And so, Richard, it, yeah, put those links in there for sure uh, so that people know okay. where they can go. And Richard will give you some marching orders as to how best to support before we get to the next set of amazing candidates. I love these candidates. You all are incredible. You belong on Capitol Hill in Congress. You'd be phenomenal upgrades over these other uh, these other freaking terrible politicians that are there now. You all, one thing I love about you all is you don't really give me that politician vibe. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that I'm talking about when people decide to run out of these districts. You know what I mean? You're, like, you're just like human beings patriots, parents who just know we can do better. So, man, I, I, I'd loved uh, each and every one of those candidates. That was great. Pressure's on you, Richard. Hop, okay. Hop in for a sec. Uh, well, you'll be uh, our transitional 
Yeah, yeah that, now this is great. We're going to go ahead and transition uh, to the next group of folks. Guys, remember to try to be, be be quick on your answers here because we have two more groups that we have to do today. Uh, Natalie Klein is coming on from West Virginia. Blair Walsington is coming on. Uh, Alan Ellison from Florida is coming on. And we also will have a video from uh, the video played. So uh, take it away. What's that? We can, we can, uh, Rob's just a video? Nice. Yeah, yeah Rob's not able to be here, so we have a video that we're going to play forget, so everybody can watch. Forget that video nonsense. Let's focus on Natalie, Blair, and Alan. That's what I'm talking about. So, uh, so first up, I'm going to go to Blair Walsingham just because I know her so well. So, Blair Walsingham is in from Tennessee. Uh, she's an Army, an Air Force vet who's running and doing incredible work. Uh, Natalie Klein is from West Virginia. So do you know Richard really well, Natalie? Um, I, I know Richard. We've met a few times. Uh, we did a, a video together at, at Teresa's studio. Um, we've talked countless times. I love Richard. Yeah, uh, I would think so. Uh, I feel yeah. like, like there aren't that many people in West Virginia doing awesome stuff. I feel yeah. like, you know. Yeah. You, All of the after. awesome people are in a nice group together, and we love and support each other. Oh, yeah, that makes me so happy. And then Alan Ellison out of Florida 17th District. Welcome, Alan. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. So I'm going to pitch it to each of you. Um, and this is fun. This makes me happy that, that we get to talk about one of my favorite things in the world, universal basic income. So I'm going to kick it off with you, Blair, because I know that you and me and UBI are all really good hey. friends. Uh, but hey, why Andrew. do you think UBI is uh, important in your community, and how do you think it would make a difference in people's lives? Well, I think obviously universal basic income is extremely important. When I hear UBI, I think freedom and equity. Many members of my district are still learning what UBI is, and they think it's really complicated, but it's honestly quite simple. It reduces bureaucracy, it empowers people, it directly affects many of our biggest issues, such as reducing crime, improving mental health, uh, returning capital to people and small businesses, while also making sure that big corporations that make billions off of our past and current tax dollar investments, such as our roadways and bridges and even our internet, uh, that they pay their fair share of taxes and they return it to us in this form of a dividend. It's just a phenomenal idea that would provide a great floor for everybody to succeed and have the door of opportunity opened. Yes, amen. You know I'm all about it. I don't want to put anyone else on the spot, Natalie and Alan, whether you all are into UBI, um, but I'll throw it out there. I guess I got a thumbs up from Natalie. Uh, uh, Alan, where are you on UBI? Well, you know, I'm a political scientist, so the, the idea of UBI is, is uh, one that goes back to the 16th century uh, with uh, Thomas. And then, it, you know, it, all of the Thomases, Thomas Paine, Thomas Spence, all of these great uh, pol political, philosophical, ideological thinkers uh, all agree that a system like UBI should work. I would say that it will work even more uh, so now today with COVID-19 and all of these corporations going out of business and really never going to come back. I think the fact that we are having to pay taxes, it's only right that the government uh, pay us. And uh, UBI is a system that could really help a lot of people right now. Yeah, there was a headline came out today that Jeff Bezos is now worth two hundred billion dollars. That seems like a, a little much for one human. How the heck are you going to spend two hundred billion dollars? I mean, he could literally run around setting piles of cash on fire, and he still couldn't get through it. Um, yeah. But I, I think that we might be able to help him with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Natalie, uh, thoughts on UBI, and then also, um, you're a woman in a from a STEM background. And that's like a, a topic that right now many people are very passionate about. Um, like, how's, what's your experience been like uh, in a STEM field that's largely male dominated? And how do you think we can improve things? So I guess you, you get a double uh, whammy of a question. Great. Love it. Um, yeah, so as, as far as UBI is concerned, I really feel like it's, it's an extension of social security. And it, it helps us to be able to level the playing field to meet our basic needs. Um, and we're doing this at a time when corporate pay and corporate profits have never been higher in the richest country on earth while minimum wage is stagnant. So yeah, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of UBI. Uh, I am a woman working in STEM. I'm a computational linguist for a software company where we make entity extraction software. 
So it's for like a lot of law enforcement um, agencies. Um, and you know, you know what Natalie sounds like? Natalie sounds like one of those movie characters. It's like we work on entity extraction software. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Continue. That's who we are. Sorry, I just wanted to, to have some that, fun that's with what your... we are. But I feel like it's one of those things that being I'm a woman up until a couple weeks ago, uh, I was the only woman at my company. We just hired um, another woman as a linguist. And we need to do more to encourage women in tech. We do not see a lot of educators encouraging females to go into STEM courses or tech courses for that matter. And we are continuing to see a gender disparity in startup funding. We really need to do more to offset this. We still are facing discrimination. And we also don't have nearly enough female mentors in our careers to help us along when we're just starting out and when, when we go in and work in, in, in these positions that are largely dominated by men. So I think there's a lot more that we can do. Um, our campaign has some ideas as far as like, you know, automated applications and admissions applications to kind of take bias away. And also with some leadership assessments that really provide more of quantitative scoring on, you know, potential um, leadership roles and, you know, career paths and moving upwards within a company. Our campaign has proposed what we're calling the Gen Z initiative as a way to help offset the drain that we're seeing in a lot of rural communities where we're seeing our youth leave in droves and it's because we don't have diversified economies so we would like to propose a gen z initiative that will help bring federal funding into communities like what we're seeing here in west virginia to give high school students zero cost virtual stem courses so that they can understand the principles of whatever the STEM subject is that they may be interested in, learn about different STEM fields such as vertical farming, coding, and IT, and maybe be well equipped at 18 years of age to jump into a career or become a young entrepreneur, especially if they have $1,000 a month in universal basic income to help them out, instead of expecting them to take on tens of thousands of student loan debt. Wow, I love that. And certainly we all know that uh, college has become overly expensive and cumbersome for many families in these districts. And we need a better way. We need uh, more varied paths. So it's not just, hey, go to college, take out these giant loans and then hope for the best. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Blair, you and I have had prior conversations. So we had conversations about um, the lack of broadband um, in various parts of Tennessee, but I'm going to ask about healthcare. Where what is the healthcare coverage uh, or access like where you are, and how do you think that we could potentially improve it or change it? The healthcare access out here in rural East Tennessee can be extremely difficult. We do have troubles with a healthcare monopoly that came in and, like many rural areas, closed down a lot of our hospitals. Uh, it's especially hard because a lot of us live far away and have a very dark mountainy road to drive on to even get to a hospital. We could start by abolishing the certificate of need so that we could see more hospitals actually open and get some of the hospitals that closed in these vital areas to be able to reopen where they're needed in, in our communities. And uh, we could also support, we have remote area clinics where they go out to some of these far out communities that just don't have the transportation or access to get to a hospital. So there's, there's a lot of work we could do to really improve this rather quickly. I love it, Blair. And there are so many folks who want to work in healthcare. It's just we end up funneling them to particular parts of the country, generally cities, because we load them up with debt too. You know, you can't be anywhere in this country without a giant freaking pile of school loans. And so then you ask some doctor or nurse to, to then go to a rural area. It's like, well, I owe $150,000 so like, of my, my degree. Um, so I, I loved what, what you were suggesting. Uh, we need to do more for sure. Ellen, I love how you did something very po po politically savvy where you just like insert a little bit of bio. We're like, well, I'm a political scientist. And then uh, everyone was like, oh, wow. Um, and now everyone's intrigued with what, what the heck your background is. So they should look you up. 
uh, Alan Ellison in Florida 17th District. So, Alan, what are your thoughts on health care and what we can do to improve? And what are you seeing in your part of Florida? Uh, right now in my part of Florida, District 17, we have about 170,000 people uh, who don't have quality uh, access to health care. Uh, right now, our hospitals are overran with COVID cases. I know uh, one hospital in particular, I think it was in Highlands County, Florida, where there was literally 30 uh, COVID cases per hour that were com that was coming in. And so we need to make sure that we have uh, adequate uh, hospital facilities, but also we need to hire more doctors. Uh, we have a very large um, elderly population inside of uh, our district. And the, the types of ailments that our elderly population uh, is constantly being plagued with. Uh, we don't always have uh, the types of doctors that can treat those ailments. So it's oftentimes uh, our populations of, of, of seniors have to go as far as two and three hours outside of uh, their communities to get access to health care. And so we want to make sure that uh, we have members uh, that are going to Congress that understand the challenges that that exist in these rural areas where uh, not only is there a, a lack of uh, quality of care, but also the fact that there are just simply not enough uh, different types of physicians that uh, our population needs. So we need to uh, not only do that, but also make it where there is some type of student loan forgiveness program so that when doctors do decide to come to these rural areas, uh, that there is some type of debt uh, forgiveness program so that they can stay here because oftentimes doctors that are that come here the debt is so high that they end up leaving to go somewhere else uh, that is going to pay a higher wage so they can get beyond their student debt and then the the community is left without the types of doctors that they need so uh, i would definitely be uh, looking to push for some type of universal health care system along with the um, universal basic income and uh, also, you know, just try to make sure that uh, they're, they're, the hospitals are looking out for the, uh, the frontline workers in a way that it doesn't put stress on them because right now uh, insurance companies and their protocols put so much stress on the entire system that uh, doctors are not able to see patients in the way that they used to. They're just going through a number system and people are just being seen very quickly a lot of times they don't even know what their problem is because the doctors haven't had a chance to uh, spend the quality of time to, to meet with those patients. So there's just a whole lot of uh, uh, issues. But universal health care is something that I, I would like to see happen in this country. I think that we could afford it. I think that we need to, especially with all of the money that we're spending over in defense. Uh, and, but that's a whole nother conversation. But that's No, no, that's this conversation. Um, you're right. We need universal health care. One thing I'll say as a numbers guy, did you know, all know that the supply of doctors hasn't changed um, even as our population has increased? Why is that? Because the medical education lobby wanted to keep the supply constrained. That's one reason why there aren't enough doctors in rural areas. Do you think there's a shortage of young people that want to be doctors? No. So why don't you freaking just train more doctors? Like that, that, that's the kind of nonsense that's going on in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love to see this group change it. And you're on your way. I am so pumped for each of these people. Like, you know, can you believe it? Alan Ellison, the political scientist in rural Florida, Blair Walsingham, the military vet and super patriot and proud Yang Ganger in Tennessee, and then Natalie Klein, the freaking computational linguist <laughs> you know, in, in West Virginia. Like, what an upgrade this set of candidates would be. Let's give them a massive round of applause and let's see they get the resources they need to win, to run and win. Imagine, yeah. the, imagine these people as your representatives. You know, if the folks in their district saw what was possible, they, they would be all over. It's just that, you know, like the, the local media I know is like not exactly, uh, you know, beating down your door. And <laughs> like, folks are, I know how it is. I know. I ran. It's freaking super terrible. Uh, but you all are the antidote we need. So thank you all so much. Let's get Natalie Blair and Alan some resources and publicity. Spread the word about each of them. Andrew, thank you for uh, reaching out to Jacob Blake's family today. That was very nice of you. Oh, thank you, Alan. I mean, they reached out and said, hey, like they'd like to hear from me. And I was like, they would like, I'll call them immediately uh, because, you know, have, uh, as a parent, like if you know that a parent's gone through what that family's going through right now, it's freaking terrible. So uh, thank you, Alan.
You know, uh, Andrew, one of the things that, you know, we, we like to explain to people is if they take the time and listen to our candidates, if they take the time and they listen to our candidates, they're going to like what they hear. And, and that's just the way that it is. And that's what we're trying to do is spread the word to as many people as we can by doing these live town halls. Because we do believe that it, when people get the chance to listen to Natalie Klein, they're going to like what they see. And then they're going to donate to do so absolutely phenomenal job guys uh the next panel is adam christensen from florida we have mia mason from from uh, maryland and we have tom pauswitz from wisconsin so thanks guys hello look at this the third panel and and we're going to be talking unfortunately about the subject that alan just raised uh which is uh what happened to jacob blake in kenosha um this, this past weekend and we're going to be talking to three awesome candidates, Mia Mason from Maryland, Tom, I might, might botch this, Tom, Palsowitz. That was pretty good, yeah, right on. All right, Tom Palsowitz, and then my guy, Adam Christensen, the youngest congressional nominee in Gainesville, Florida. It's surgical tape, my son. Daddy's working. It's tape for surgery. Go, go do your thing. All right. Playing another um, room. So... <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, so, Mia, unfortunately, Maryland has seen its fair share of these issues related to uh, police um, violence and brutality. I was talking to a friend of mine, Wes Moore, just wrote or co-wrote a book about the aftermath of the Freddie Gray riots. Uh, what do you think that we should be doing at a national level to better address uh, what happened to Jacob Blake uh, this past number of days? We need to call it out for exactly what it is. They walked right by a kid who was armed to the teeth, ready to kill even more, turn around and maybe even kill the police officers who were walking behind him. This has to stop. If I was in Afghanistan and I saw a kid with a weapon, me and Richard know exactly what we would have done. We would have pulled the trigger because we knew what the rules of engagement were. Okay? Here in America, we know that the different rules of engagement are different. We have to make sure that we detain somebody. We had an opportunity to, to correct this. They walked by it. They passed an opportunity. They rather go to a car, pull somebody out, and shoot them in the back. It's, it's travesty. We have to either get rid of them, retrain them, or correct them. No matter who they are, we have to say that this is systematic racism. The data proves it. And you have to either get out of the police department or get retrained and accept the responsibility and don't turn off that body camera because the DA will be there to hold you accountable. Thank you, Mia. That was so strong uh, and passionate. Uh, Tom, what do you think we can be doing uh, to help make, make it so that there are no more Jacob Blakes and their families? Yeah, this has been tough because Kenosha is probably 45 minutes down the highway from, from where I am right now. And um, it's been a tough week. And, you know, I've been thinking about two different things. I've been thinking about compliant and complicit. And what I keep hearing over and over again is I keep hearing people say, if, if these people would have just complied, they'd be fine. If Jacob Blake would have just complied, there wouldn't have been a problem. If George Floyd would have just complied, there wouldn't be a problem. If Brianna Taylor would have just complied, there wouldn't be a problem. And that is just not true. And we've gotten to this point in this country where people think if there's just people being compliant, everything will be okay. And we're not a country that even was even founded on being compliant. We, we protest, we get out there. We were founded on, you know, throwing off the yoke of the British empire. This is, this is the way that we show who we are in this country. And, you know, I just personally don't think anybody should get shot for not complying. Maybe for, for something else, but definitely not complying. But here's the other thing. It's, it's about being complicit. You know, the Milwaukee Bucks, my, my favorite team, you know, they, they didn't play yesterday, but they called out the Wisconsin State Legislature because they're not doing anything. And you know what happened today in the Wisconsin State Legislature? Nothing. Crickets. And I'm actually running against our, our Senate Majority Leader, and he didn't even have to, an answer today to be able to say we should, we should either do something or not do something. That is how little they care about this subject. But I, I think it all comes down to racial equity. 
You know, Milwaukee County uh, declared racism a public health crisis last year. And ever since then, they've been moving that forward. And I personally believe one of the things I want to do when I get to Washington is let's look at the federal budget through a lens of racial equity. Let's start working on changing things that are completely unfair in this society, especially the budget and the criminal justice system. That's where I think it needs to start. Tom, I can't tell you how uh, how infuriating I found this entire compliance narrative where, but you know, I, I uh, spoke to Jacob Blake's family today and then people were tweeting at me like if you'd only complied and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, like that the, the man that got shot seven times in the back going to his car that had his kids in it. It's like on, on what planet is that like uh, the sort of action that gets you shot seven times? So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that you you're uh, calling it out uh, the, the way that, in my opinion, like Americans with uh, humanity and judgment look up and say, look, it, it's not that, uh, you know, an, an encounter with a police officer is supposed to end and you're getting shot. Like, 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 like that's right. not, you know, and I, I also said something to that effect, too. I said, you shouldn't expect to be shot. It's, it, it's like, you know, right. literally unless you're about to incur bodily harm on someone and that's like 100 percent clear, but like anything short of that. Uh, Adam, I know you have very strong feelings on this subject. Um, uh, would love to, to hear where you are on this. I think I'm where everybody else is, uh, to be honest. I think and I've had a lot of people call me in the last couple of days and just like, I'm done. I am done. We are sick of it. And I think at the end of the day, you know, right now in our society, we don't hold people accountable for their actions. We have for years. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what position of power they're in. When somebody screws up, we just refuse to hold them accountable. And I think right now what we are seeing is people that are, are, are they've lost complete faith in the system. They've lost complete faith in, in being American. Because a police officer does not to be the judge, jury, and executioner when it comes to justice. They get to enforce the law. They do not get to take it into their own hands. And what we keep seeing over and over again is they are doing that. And until they are held accountable for their actions, until it is very clear that number one, society does not function correctly and will not function correctly until it is taken care of. I don't think we should be functioning. I think the NBA players that said, we're done, we're not playing until you fix this, we're right. I think the MLB needs to start. I think every single sports league needs to say, you don't get your entertainment. You don't get to see us do what we do. You don't get us to work for you and be essential you treat us like we're disposable and i think everyone is at that point where we are ready as a country to shut everything down until we get treated as human and i think that's where we're at you know the lack of accountability hits home for so many americans and i said this on the trail i said well you know the people that crashed the economy the financial crisis uh, any of them get held accountable no the pharma executives who addicted uh, millions on opiates and made billions of dollars. Anyone get held accountable there? No. Like, and you see it with the, with these uh, terrible police shootings where everyone's just looking around saying like, you know, who's responsible for this? Uh, and uh, and no one's responsible. To your point, Adam, and Americans are just getting uh, sick and tired of it. And we can all sense it around us, too. I'm actually going to say, too, that our politicians don't feel terribly accessible or accountable either because they look up and, and they actually... Uh, are better served by standing up and saying, um, you know, we couldn't get anything done because the other side's fault than trying to do their job. Like that, there's like a lack of accountability um, from our members of Congress too, uh, particularly where this crisis has been concerned. It's like, we should have had a stimulus bill, you know, in my opinion, months ago that, that helped address these lapsed benefits that are now pushing many, many Americans into distress, which leads me to this question that is related to what we're discussing right now, which is we're in the most extreme winner take all economy in the history of the world, and it's just becoming more extreme. I just commented that Jeff Bezos is now worth two hundred billion dollars. Two hundred billion dollars. When you think about that, like it's hard for any of us to think about what one billion dollars would be, uh, much less having two hundred billion. Uh, so, Mia, what are your thoughts on how we can uh, help rebalance our economy so that it works for people and families in Maryland and around the country? Well. Besides what you brought forward, like UBI, we have a lot of federal plans that can be brought forward, like the Green New Deal, 
a lot of the economical plans that can help us with Medicare for all. You know, my fortune cookie, I'm still holding it. It says, you know, you have just only begun to scratch the surface of your real potential. You know, take that for granted sometimes about like how far we've come from serving our military to basically running for office to make a difference because we are tired of seeing what has happened to us happen to so many others. I remember when I lost my job, I lost my car, I lost everything for being who I was. And then to see that happen again when this administration has divided us and to realize that tomorrow I'm going to Martin Luther King's memorial to be there out of service and realize that that monument is divided for a reason. And our country is like that monument, it is divided. We need to make sure that our country becomes united. We must be able to elect un leaders that are going to unite our country and make our country go forward, not backwards any further. This is honestly what we need to do for our entire world together. We are only here for such a short amount of period. This pandemic has taught us something, okay? We have representatives who have voted against it since 2019. They voted against it just recently. It is time to get their legacy out of here. We have to tell them this is our land. This is our vote. We have to be their friend. We have to be their advocate. We have to make that change now because when we take a look at these programs, we know how it's gonna get funded. It's gonna be us representing them today and tomorrow. And we need them to do that right now by getting their ballot and making sure that they fill it out and submit it into that ballot box this October. That's why we're here tonight, to make sure that we change the shape of America, to make us whole in America. That is why we are fighting so hard to restore the equity and equality in this country, to bring that reform and balance back to the soul of our country. I hope that answers our question, but right now in Maryland, it is deeply disturbed. And in our red district, it is hurting to the red of their souls. And that's why we've lost so many to COVID-19 that many have left. And even as our governor has said that we are trying to reopen right now for the schools, we have to do better. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. That was incredible and very passionate. Uh, Tom, what are your thoughts on how we can try and rebalance the economy so it works for the folks you see every day uh, in Wisconsin, as opposed to Jeff hanging out on his uh, spaceship? Does he actually have a spaceship he hangs out on? Well, he's you probably know, building he, one. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he's, he's there's, definitely, yeah. there's definitely a space rocket somewhere in the garage, or not the garage. Yeah, he's got a yeah he's, 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 it's, it's part of the plan. Yeah, he's got some Amazon guys working on it. But I, I just want to say, Mia, thank you, because uh, that, that was very moving, and I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I was in banking for 15 years, and one of the one of the first things I learned in banking was because I did risk management for banks. What I found out was the closer you are to money, the easier it is to make money because you can absolutely show a scorecard that shows here's what I here's what value I brought and here's how much I get. In our society, the closer you work with people, if you're a social worker, if you're a teacher, if you're just out there helping people, it's hard to measure, and therefore we undervalue it substantially. And I just think that in this country, we need, we need a much better scorecard to say, what are we actually trying to accomplish in our society? That Forbes 400 list is probably the worst idea in the world when it comes to creating a scorecard in the country, because it absolutely creates competition in ways that hurts our society. I mean, you've got guys going, I'm worth 190 billion, I'm worth 200 billion, I'm worth 210 billion, and that doesn't help the rest of us. And it creates this huge gap in equality that the rest of us are fighting because these guys want to compete. Let's compete on something better. Let's compete on how about how many well-paying jobs you created, how many how many people you can cover with health insurance, uh, you, what you've been able to do um, for your fire and police and everything else in your in, in your communities. What have you been actually been able to do with that money? So I just think we need a much better scorecard in this country because I think if we don't measure it, it's hard to manage, and and we just got to change the dynamic because. Everybody knows that education is valuable. Everybody knows that um, healthcare is valuable. Everybody knows that things that benefit society are tremendously valuable, but we continue to underpay for those services. And it, it absolutely drives me nuts. So I'm committed to helping create a much better scorecard for this country. And there's gotta be a better way to allow capitalists to compete where they want to. 
And I think that's that's going to be the start of a way to change the dynamic because there's too much money in the hands of the few. Tom, have you read my stuff? <laughs> I, of course I have, but you know, but I when I I learned this in banking because I used to trade derivatives and I used to trade money. Yeah, of you course know, you have. I didn't, I didn't expect that you had, but yeah, like I couldn't agree with you more that we we're, we're staring at the wrong measurements and it's yeah, we're just looking at the wrong stuff. And it, and there's very few people that understand it, you know, because most people hate math. So when you talk about scorecards, it goes out the window because most people hate math, so most people are bad at it. I've been teaching small business owners math for the last 15 years. And it, you know it works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. But the bottom line is, we need to put the value in our society where the value truly is. Yes, human-centered economy—that's what I'm talking about. And I got to say, Tom Adams cut from the same cloth because he's a, been a small business owner and entrepreneur. So, Adam, how the heck do we fix this economic freaking mess we're in? You know, just—I mean, I'm going to piggyback back right off what Tom said. Greed is not good. Greed is not sustainable. Greed is not how you build an economy that actually works. And I've started a couple small businesses, and I can tell you right now that there is one path being told to every single entrepreneur, and that path is that you have an idea, and then you go out and get as much money as you freaking can to inflate the value and hope that you can sell it for a ginormous amount of money and get out before the entire bubble crashes. That's it. That is how we have built our small businesses. That is how we have built our economy. That is how we have built our world. And we've done it before. That's what most people I don't think realize at this moment is we have done that before. Over a hundred years ago, we had a guy whose main mantra was speak softly carry a big stick. And what he decided to do was he was going to go against the people like Jeff Bezos and like Mark Zuckerberg. And he said that Rockefeller, you are killing capitalism. He said that JP Morgan, you are killing the free economy. Trusts and monopolies and corporate cartels, you are what is wrong with America. And they created the first progressive movement. And that is where we are right now. That is where young people are. That is where people who have gone through two bailouts in 12 years are. They are ready and they are tired of speaking softly for 40 years. They are tired of being taken advantage of for 40 years. And it's time for them to start picking up a big damn stick and knocking them down. And I think that is where we are at as a society is people, when their backs get against a wall, they have two options. They either lay down and die where they come out swinging. And I think all of us, the reason we are running in these districts is because we are not about to lay down and die. We are going to go out swinging. Wow, what, what an apt note to, to close out on because I agree. Everyone here is a fighter. Everyone here is standing up and saying we can do better. And you all really can do better like if, if this group were in congress i don't know about the rest of you but i sure would go to sleep easier at night <laughs> thinking that tom and mia and adam and gary and everyone else uh were actually doing the people's work on our behalf and you can tell that they're they're not motivated by status or power they just want to do positive things and get things done um so i am so thrilled that we've gotten a sense as to what the possibilities are for us all that with leaders like this we actually could start moving things in a better direction and i want everyone watching this right now imagine if these people were your representatives that is what we have to make possible we have to get the word out we have to donate we have to tell our friends in their districts we have to tell our friends that aren't in their districts but just would love to know about them we have to get the word out for each and every one of these candidates so that they have everything they need to win in November, and I'll say this too, uh, is that the sky's the limit for the, each of these candidates, no matter what, win or lose, because they're growing tremendously as a result of this process, and their growth is just going to continue. Um, take it from a, a guy who is 0 for 1 in his presidential <laughs> campaigns, that, you know, that the growth that each of them is, is, is undergoing will just continue to take them towards solving big problems, uh, running for other races and roles 
But more than that, uh, the just the, they're they're going to be pulled forward by the followings that they built and the fact that people believe in them. So we're going to get the vote out. We're going to get the resources out. We're going to do everything we can. Um, and, but regardless of what the outcomes are for each of them in November, each of them is going to continue to make their mark. Uh, and that's something that I, hopefully I, I represent myself, where people feel pretty positively about Andrew Yang, despite my current uh, 0 for 1 record in the presidential campaign. Um, and, and I feel great, too, where the, there's like more and more energy around uh, me and humanity forward and, and the things that we can do. And that will be true for each and every one of you as well. You're going places uh, and you're going places very, very fast. And we need you. We need you to get there as quickly as possible. So let's help them all get to where they're going as quickly as humanly possible. Thank you all so much. Uh, freaking love this group of candidates. Love No Dems Left Behind. And uh, Richard, I think you're yeah. the official spokesperson. So I'll let you get in the final word. I just want to thank you very much for taking the time. I know that you are a very busy person. Our candidates absolutely appreciate this. This was one of the most exciting. When we when we let it out that you were going to be given a town hall, everybody was extremely fired up. But we actually have uh, one of our candidates that actually had to evacuate due to the storm, which is Rob Anderson. And he's got a quick little video that I think we should close it out with. But I want to give it to you, uh, uh, Andrew, if you want to say a few more words. But th thank you, thank you, thank you. For what you've done we should us. definitely close out with rob he's freaking uh, evacuating from hurricane laura so let's uh let's wish him well um let's hear from him and then i'll say something after you play the video i'm waiting for permission <laughs> technology I'll, so i'll tell you something all funny that pe people expect me to be like like incredibly tech savvy because i'm sort of like the tech candidate too <laughs> so it's like a lot of pressure Anytime we have one of these, it's like, oh, we better get the settings right or else people will be like, aren't you the tech guy? Before we, kick this, before we kick this video off, I also want to state that everybody also should think about this because we were talking about the issue with the, with the police issue. Think about what happens if we start tying police brutality lawsuits to the retirements of those police officers. Make no mistake about it. They'll be far less likely to go off their swing in a stick and squeeze in a trigger. Guaranteed. Well said, Bobby, Richard. It's up you. All oh. right, here we go. Running for Congress in Louisiana's third congressional district. Speaking to you from home because we're battening down for a hurricane. Sorry, I can't be there tonight. Um, if you're watching this video, that means we had power outages from Hurricane Laura down here in Louisiana. So we recorded this clip ahead of time to make sure that I would be able to participate in tonight's town hall with special guest Andrew Yang. Big fan of Andrew Yang when he was running, uh, loved his UBI. Uh, the idea of a universal basic income guaranteeing uh, participation of all the people in the cash flow that we have as a means of putting money back into the economy was a groundbreaking one and a good idea for the 21st century. In our district, we're running on the belief that you cannot have economic justice without social justice. I'm Rob Anderson and enjoy the rest of the town hall. That was a great message. What a oh handsome God. guy Rob is. He's so rugged. He gave us that close up look too. You can really see the, <laughs> the stubble and the gravity. Plus he had that deep radio voice. I would not be surprised if it was like, this is Rob Anderson, like on <laughs> your local radio dial. Uh, so I'm glad he said, I hope he's safe. Uh, so he to close safe. out tonight, just want to say how incredibly uh, blown away and grateful I am to each and every one of you for taking on the challenge of running. Uh, again, I've lived it. I've experienced a version of it. A and you all really are going to just continue to ascend in various ways. Uh, you know, that the, in, in part because you've taken on difficult challenges for the right reasons. You know what I mean? It's like it, it's it's something I can relate to because like if you have some career politician, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to do this and to do that. And then like that, they're always just trying to kind of jump to the next step. That's not you. You all are high character uh, human beings and individuals who just said, look, we need better. I believe I can do better. And then you had to push through a lot even to get to where you are right now. I know you did. Um, and I know it sometimes feels thankless and difficult, but just know that 
it's going to pay off and inspire more people than you even imagine. Guaranteed. Like, you're going to be someplace and then someone's going to come to you and be like, hey, love you. And you'll be like, wow, like, you know, I didn't think anyone was noticing uh, what I was doing here in Gainesville or uh, in eastern Tennessee. But they know and we know. And I've seen it over and over again. I've seen this process. It's one of the beauties of entrepreneurship, really, um, where you all embody that same spirit. You see an entrepreneur, their thing works out, their thing doesn't work out. That entrepreneur uh, comes back and comes back again and is on their way. Uh, and the least we can do, those of us watching, is when you see someone who takes on uh, an important challenge with the right spirit and character, you got to help them. You got to help them try and get to where they're going. And that actually says a lot about you. As a person, when you respond positively to folks who are doing the right thing, uh, that's how incredible movements get built. That's how beautiful things get accomplished. And each of you, you're going to accomplish beautiful things. So thank you all so much. I look forward to being in touch. I'm going to follow you all on Twitter, so you can then um, hit me up that that way. That, that's a, a, absolutely the least I can do. And if you're watching this, let's help these candidates win. Imagine them as your representative. That is something that we can make possible, and let's let's get to work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Andrew.